And welcome to Hero Power. I'm your host, Avantes, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Matt at Arms. Matt at Arms. Because he's not here. <laughs> Where did he go? Can, can, can you hear me now? I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you too. Okay. So two out of four people can, can hear me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll come back to him. And for the first time in a few weeks, uh, filling in for uh, the absent uh, Zeroshio tonight, we have Versica. Welcome back, sir. How's it going? It's good. Good to have you back. Uh, some people have missed you. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, couldn't leave you guys hanging when I found out that Zeroshio had some personal stuff to take care of. I was like, well, then that just means I need to get on there and and uh, visit with the guys. Yeah, well, uh, and that is something. Uh, if you are listening, please keep, Zer uh, keep Zeroshio and his family in your thoughts. Um, his dad is having to, uh, is in the hospital tonight, and so Zeroshio is there by his dad's side, and, uh, you know, things happen, and family always comes first, so, uh, just keep him and his family in your thoughts. So, uh, Matt at Arms, are you there? Do we have you now? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I guess this is a good time to just let everybody know that we are trying Discord we tonight. So, <laughs> new tech. Thanks to me. <laughs> it's like I'm going to Skype working. New tech. And <laughs> speaking of our very special guest, for the second time on Hero Power, we have the recent HCT Fall Championship Qualifier, Bloody Face. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. We are yep. super excited to have you. You are joining a very small group of repeat guests. So Sweet. We are super happy to have you on. Congratulations yeah, on a big here. weekend. <laughs> Thank and, you. And happy birthday, belatedly. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was a pretty good birthday present to qualify. Yeah, what right. was it you, you posted on Twitter? Going to try to pull a Tyler and and win on yep. your birthday, and you did. <laughs> apparently, birth, apparently, birthday luck's just the best kind of luck. I mean, <laughs> can't lose on your birthday, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna get into that here with you in just a moment. Uh, first up, though, we do have an iTunes review to talk about this week. Um, it is a five star review from Matador, Matador Dog. It's uh, titled, Good Podcast Improving to Upper Tier. He says, I've listened to Hero Power for a while now. It's always been fun, but the addition of Mad at Arms takes it to another level. The three hosts are passionate about Hearthstone. Zeroshio is the overzealous champion who call, tell, loves Hearthstone to its core. Avantis keeps the show on course. Conus, these guys love women Hearthstone players. If any female does anything close to relevant in the Hearthstone scene, they will surely mention it on their show. Keep up the great work. Uh, thank you very much, Matador Dog. We love to hear from uh, people who listen to the show, and we greatly appreciate iTunes reviews. So uh, you you missed part of that second sentence. It says, the addition of Matted Arms takes it to another better level. And that was one of the reasons why we reached out to Matt at Arms to begin with when I took my break was so that we were bringing in a good quality uh, cerebral caster that, that knows the game inside and out and is passionate about the game and wants to wants to grow the community and to, to help the community get better. So it, thank you for noticing that. And, uh, you know... We we have talks in the works, so yeah, exactly. So we'll drop a little teaser there. <laughs> but let's get right into the news. Um, this past weekend, 
was the HCT America's Fall Playoffs. We saw uh, a bunch of players come in to the weekend ready to battle it out. And they went head to head right up to uh, we had our top eight, which included uh, Bloody Face himself, uh, Tencho, Just Saying, Language Hacker, Peltire, Purple, ETC, and Sal Hune. So this was a great lineup. Most of these people, if you follow tournaments at all, you've heard of most of these players. Mm-hmm. Yeah, can you can you hear us now, Matt? Yeah, I can hear you. Can okay. you hear me? That's the most important thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah I can yes. hear you. All right. So yeah, this was not a just roundup of players. This was almost a who's who of Hearthstone tournament players, and the some of you know these players are top tier. So after some great games, which if you haven't watched any of it, I highly recommend going back and checking out the VODs for the weekend. Um, Our top four moving on to the fall championships are Tencho, Just Saying, our buddy Language Hacker, and our buddy Bloody Face. And man, again, congratulations. You played so well all weekend. Thank you. Appreciate it. So yeah, we were we were really rooting for you. We were we were uh, texting back and forth uh, while awesome. you were playing. So we were we were definitely uh, you definitely had a cheering section. <laughs> I really Thank appreciate you. the support. Yeah. So um, let's let's kind of talk about this weekend. Why don't you kind of tell us? Your from your perspective, I know you wrote you recently just wrote an article on the Hearthstone subreddit about it. But you know, for our listeners uh, who may not do Reddit, why don't you kind of give us uh, uh, the the version that you wrote and talk about your weekend? All right, sure. Uh, I'll try to try to keep it a little bit more brief. I probably don't need to go over every single round, but. Uh, I mean, basically, going into it, you know, I looked at other tournaments and saw, you know, APAC and EU both had their playoffs, and there was also DreamHack Montreal. And generally, when going into a tournament, you want to look at previous metagames to try and figure out how people are going to adapt and what people are going to bring. Uh, Otherwise, you're just going to be, you know, guessing blind. And if you looked at the results at uh, APAC and EU playoffs, there was a lot of aggro, and Control did really well. So... Typically, when something does really well, or when a certain type of deck gets dominated, aggro, you know, in this case, didn't do as well and controlled it really well, you should expect, you know, a downtick in aggro and an uptick in control. And also an uptick in anti-control as well, since you expect more control. Um, so because of that, I ended up going with the anti-control lineup. I played Death Rattle Hunter, Even Lock, Quest Rogue, and uh, Mally Ghost Druid. I mean, these are all decks I was comfortable with in general. Plus, I have an affinity for playing slow decks like i don't really like playing aggressive decks i want to play decks where the games go long and you get to leverage your skill um so yeah that's the lineup i went with and uh yeah obviously worked out pretty well i did face five out of nine bad matchups out of nine rounds i played against aggressive decks five times which is unfavored i went three and two in total against the aggro decks so you know i had to get a little bit lucky for that to happen uh, but you know, I also, I, but then I also went 4-0 against all the slow decks, which basically was my lineup designed to target. So, uh, you know, with a little bit of luck against the aggro decks, my lineup did what it was supposed to do and paid off. So, yeah. Well, that's that's awesome, and that's you know, <laughs> we we talk all the time on the show about you know how most of us as hosts are not fans of the aggro meta we we prefer oh, really? slow we we all prefer the slow control type where you actually have to think about your turns and you know you want to, to take it to the rope and and make sure you're making optimal plays i personally just that's my favorite way to play the game versica shaking his head sorry i just i was wondering where i was for a moment it's like so much has changed since i left <laughs> Hasn't changed that much. 
Well, no, but I mean, I, I think we like Hearthstone to just be in a place where everything's viable. And usually when aggro is in charge, it's only really aggro that's viable. Or that's what it feels like. So, you know, it's been, um, yeah, it, it's, it's been an interesting year as far as meta goes. And I, I actually, going back to your lineup, I really liked what you brought. I thought it was really well thought out. And I think you played it perfectly. So when, when, when I, I, I'm kind of known as anti-aggro, but it's not really anti-aggro. It's more anti, uh, I, I don't, I, anti-unbalanced. So I actually liked what you brought and uh, I, I, I thought it paired well against the field. And so I, I, I enjoy watching great players evaluate a tournament field and absolutely nail it. And I feel like you absolutely nailed it. And you, you it's almost like you, know, you hear the casters talk all the time about that tournament sub-meta developing as the tournament progresses. And I felt like that was very much on display this weekend. And watching you navigate it was amazing. Awesome. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Um, so, <clears throat> one of the things we're going to talk about is uh, the deck that we're going to get actually see you play later tonight, and that's Quest Rogue. So you had Quest Rogue in your lineup. It was the second most brought deck to the tournament. Um, mm -hmm. I know you said you were comfortable with these and you had kind of compared lineups to um the eu and the apac but were, were there any other deciding factors that went into you know you settling on malagos druid cube hunter quest rogue and even lock yeah um so i actually was gonna play control priest I had Control Priest in my lineup like 24 hours before the deadline. I actually had Odd Rogue in my lineup an hour before the deadline. I probably switched my lineup half a dozen times in the last 24 hours. Uh, but a lot of it just came down to um, just what I thought the strongest decks were. And also, I talked to Knoblord a little bit. I didn't really work with anybody in particular. I mean, I talked to Knoblord, but it's not like we were planning on playing the exact same decks. It just happened that... Originally, I was going to play, like, a Mechathune lineup with, like, I was going to play anti-aggro. Because I thought, you know, anti-aggro is really good in the metagame right now. But after it just did so well, I didn't want to bring it anymore since everybody knew about it already. You, you know, Dr. Go, Obvious. Did, didn't want to go with that Doc, ho Hockey Boys for Mechathune lineup? Not necessarily the Hockey Boys lineup, but the Doc Obvious lineup. I don't know if you remember that. But he ran Control Priest, Mechathune Warrior. Um, he ran... Uh, you run Maligos Druid with Mechathune, although I wasn't really sold on that. And then uh, I forget what the last deck he had. Oh, uh, he had a Control Warlock. Mm. Um, or yeah, I think he had something like that. Or you might just no, he had Even Lock. That's right. But yeah, I was thinking of going just anti aggro. But after I talked to Nobbler, he said that uh, some of the other people you were talking to were all just considering bringing Maligos and Quest Rogue. And just hearing that, I was like, oh, well, if people are playing. <laughs> slow decks, then I should just play anti-control decks, and, you know, that coupled with seeing how aggro didn't do well, you know, basically all the stuff I already touched on. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I mean, to go over the specifics between Odd Rogue and Quest Rogue and why I think they're so close, Odd Rogue has better matchups all around. It's, like, works better in a good stuff lineup. Like, there's really nothing besides, like, Mali Goes for Mildred that, like, really crushes you. So being a 40-60 at worst against most of the decks is a really nice feeling, whereas with uh, Quest Rogue, you're going to be like a 30-70 against Zoo and Odd Rogue. And if somebody brings both of their decks in the lineup, you know, and, 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 on, and on top of that, like, you have to be comfortable playing the deck in, in games where you're super behind. And that's kind of a, that's kind of a tough, like, you know, mentally, mentally hard thing to do, you know. Going into a matchup knowing you're just so unbelievably unfavored and still trying to figure out, like, how to win the game. And it can also be stressful, too, because if you get in a situation where, like, you might win the game, you don't want to, like, screw it up. And with a deck like Quest Rogue, any small mistake will make you lose the game. So that's why I was so hesitant to bring it. But 
you know, going into the tournament, I played Quest Rogue for probably four to six hours every day. And I finally reached a point where I felt comfortable. And even then, I still wasn't sure. But uh, some last-minute ladder play actually pushed me to Quest Rogue because I played against two people that were playing uh, playing Odd Warrior on ladder that I knew were going to prelims. So I was like, okay, that's two more data points telling me. All the data points that I had gotten so far told me people are playing control and anti-control. I haven't gotten one single data point. You know, all by it, it's only like four or five different people I had heard from. So I was like, all right, let's just play Quest Rogue. Everyone's telling me it's the most powerful deck. I know it's really powerful. It ended up working really well. Um, so yeah. I mean, for me, a lot of the tournament is all about the prep. The, the tournament itself is just about, you know, you're already at the tournament. You already know the matchups. You already know how to play it well. You know, just, just play solid. You know, just let the lineup carry you, basically. I think that's what a lot of competitive cards, you know, card games are going to be about is at the highest level the play is so tight that the only way you're going to get an edge is by playing decks that are just good against the field mm -hmm. so it's, it's kind of why i'm talking more about the prep than the actual tournament if that makes well, sense when i think of you i think rogue and i guess that's oh, yeah. because you know when when we first met at that at the first uh first qualifier that's that's what I, I saw you play Miracle, and I'm like, wow, I think he's the best Miracle Rogue player I've seen. So, you know, throughout your career, as we've as we followed you, it, it, it's, it's just like every time it seems that Rogue is, is good or decent, your name keeps popping up here at the top. And I, you know, so I actually, when I found out you were bringing Quest Rogue, I was just like, wow, he's going to do really well with that. That's going to be... That's going to be the deck that if I was playing as Bloody Face, that's what I would ban. <laughs> you know. Okay. Yeah, um, even against the aggro decks, it, it gets fair share of wins. Yeah, yeah, it's a really solid deck and a really good deck. Just in the meta, even on ladder right now, it's really good. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, before we move on to the next question, um, there was a there, and you may not. I don't know if you'll remember this because it's like one play out of the whole weekend. But there was a game where you actually made the decision to hold the quest and not play it until turn four, instead of playing it leading out with it on turn one, like people are prone to do. Can you talk about that and what led to that decision? And it's not the game against Tincho in top eight. I, I believe so. Yeah. I believe that was game three. Um, yeah, so I, I do remember that game. Um, not playing quest on turn one is something you actually frequently do against aggro decks. If you keep Glacial Shard or South Sea Dakin in your hand, and you're playing against Zoo, for example, uh, you can just trade into a Flame Imp, you can trade into a Coin Kelsa. If they just play Cobalt Librarian or Voodoo Doctor, you can just Hero Power it and have a nice 2-1 in play. So the quest itself does need to get completed, but against the aggro decks, um, if you... If you have Sonya in your hand, that's uh, one of the that's probably what you're going to complete quest on, and you want to use your other cards to just fight off the aggression. And my opening hand that game, I remember I kept Glacial Shard on the play, uh, and I drew Sonya. So I think, I think even if I didn't have Sonya, I still might have played Glacial Shard. I'm not 100 percent sure about that, but going on the play against Secret Hunter and going turn one Glacial Shard, it just thwarts so many of their like nut draws against you. Because one of their nut draws is if they go Secret Keeper into Secret next turn, and you just run away the game with the Secret Keeper. Well, if you go turn one Glacial Shard, they can't, they can't Secret Keeper and run away the game. If they go turn one Dire Mole, then okay, then you just get to trade the Glacial Shard, and you get to Hero Power, and you don't have to worry about the Crackling Razor Mole. I mean, that's how that's how Secret Hunter wins that matchup. They don't win the matchup by like spell stoning you or like playing Houndmaster, or, like Rexar. Like you don't care about any of those cards. You have cards like Banish and. You know, you have, like, all these taunts and stuff that you can slow them down that way. So, really, the only way you lose is from early aggression in that matchup. So, that's why I play the Tron Glacial Shard. Um, but, yeah, also because I had the Sonya. So, I knew that, like, okay, even if I miss a tick on the quest with Glacial Shard, I have Sonya to complete the quest with. Um, but, yeah, even without the Sonya, I still think it might have been correct. Okay. Well, that, that but, was... Yeah. It was a great play, and I was, you know, I wanted to... To hear your thoughts behind it. Uh, Matt at Arms, I believe you have the next question. It was something you were interested in knowing. Yeah, uh, I was looking at, I was looking at your uh, Malagos Druid list, and 
I'm not familiar so much with the Tarantus tech. I'm just curious what kind of the meaning, the what that's there in there for, other than the fact that it's a giant twelve twelve that nobody can remove. So this actually comes from Noblord, and if you don't know Noblord, he's an amazing player. He's finished rank one legend two seasons ago. He finished top twenty five legend last season. He all did it all with Maligos Druid, all with the exact same list. So whenever it comes to Maligos Druid, and I'm talking to Noblord, one I'm going to put all my one hundred percent blind trust in him because I know whatever he says about Maligos Druid is going to be better than what I say. And he, he gave me his list, and he just said, you play Tyrannus and Starfall over my two giggling inventors, and I was like, I will not question this whatsoever. But I but to get, that's the real reason I did it. But I do understand the Tyrannus deck, and I can explain it a little bit, other than just saying it's blind faith. Um, Tyrannus is especially good in the Druid Mirror, and with my lineup against slower decks, you're going to be banning Quest Rogue a lot of the time. I don't really care about the Druid matchup. Mm-hmm. Um, and ty- if, you, if you can just ramp into Tyrannus, like, they can't naturalize it. Uh, they can't... It, this is it's so frustrating for them, because all I can do is play a 1-5 Spreading Plague, and, you know, you can get past that pretty easily. So, one Tyrannus is going to be insane in the Druid Mirror, which everybody brings a Druid deck. Like, that's just a given. So, you already know that it's going to be good no matter what lineup you play against. But also, um, because we know there's going to be a slower meta, you're going to tend to see a lot more slower decks. And, you know, even decks like... You know, I played against Hot Warrior, I played against Q Block. Even these kind of decks don't really have answers for Tyrannus. Uh, another reason is is uh, Odd Warrior. The rest of my lineup is really solid against Odd Warrior. And Maligos Druid itself can struggle against Odd Warrior. Uh, Odd Warrior can just run you out of threats. You know, if they Shield Slam, BGH, or Lich King, Alex Traza, gain a farmer, so you can't Maligos burst them. Uh, yeah, you can you can just lose the game, and Tyrannus is just an extra threat against them so that uh, you can just keep applying the pressure. And, you know, over the weekend, that... Even a, even a matchup like even lock, they can run you out of threat sometime. It's just the extra threat just goes really far. That's awesome. So that, that's the main reason. That's outstanding. I I've, I've never thought of that, and I just figured you know Tarantus, whatever, it's gigantic twelve twelve dude. It's not going to do anything. But the fact that <laughs> it's something that yeah nobody can remove except for like maybe an, an odd warrior, and they remove all their armor in the process is right. it's it's phenomenal. Yeah, it was. Once it was MVP, but it was very, very good that weekend. Okay. okay. MVP for me was probably Twig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, like I definitely drew. I think I drew Twig in half my games, and I was very lucky. That's, that's, that's yeah. so good. <laughs> that is really good. I mean, that's why you play Mali. Like the, the mill deck has the Dream Petal Flores. You know, the Taunt Druid has Hydronox. Token Druid has Savage Roar. But like Mali, it's all about the twig, in my opinion. If you can just get the twig turns off, that deck can do some pretty absurd things. Yeah, but well, I, I don't think anyone can argue with you. Yeah, it's, <laughs> that card is unreal. Yeah, t- twenty mana in one turn is usually pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, shifting now to um, your game one against Peltar. Mm-hmm. T- towards the end of the game, what was it? overly tempting for you to just go all in with King Crush? Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> definitely. I never thought once about going... I mean, I always like calculate how much damage it would be, but you know, with the two Witchwood Grizzlies in your hand and after he's used the uh, after he's used the cube and it naturalized, it gets pretty tough for him to kill the Hydronox. So as long as I can keep that cubed King Crush and keep that Witchwood Grizzly up, you know, just blocking the attacks from... Uh, Hydronox, it's going to be pretty hard for him to get a full board of taunts. I mean, the game did end up him having double cube and double naturalize, I think, so he was able to kill him somewhat easily, but if there was one turn where he didn't have it, one, he would have just been straight up dead, and two, even if he does have it, you want to keep that cube Hydronox, or sorry, the cube King Crush for as long as possible. Yeah, there's no room for silence in the Druid decks right now, so yeah, it's pretty... Yeah, no silence. He did have one window... To swipe it, I had six. I think I had seven minions on board. I think if he, I think I traded the cube into a tar creeper, so it was a five four. It was buffed with Kalsa. And if he had swiped that turn, then I don't know. It, the thing, the game would have been a lot different because he would have popped the cube. I only would have gotten one king crush, but then he couldn't have got the hydronox taunts. But I think if he did that, I don't think I can push through enough because I lose my cube king crush and. I can't kill him the next turn, so every turn after that, if he just keeps looping taunts, I probably can't get through that, but I'm not 100% sure. 
Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I think that was his one turn window that game. Yeah. So do you, do you think he just over? I mean, just watching it, it seems like he was in his head a little bit. Yeah, I went back and watched the replay. Um, I, don't, I I saw a few mistakes I made as well, yeah. uh, especially in the hundred even lock game. I also made a mistake that game. I it was just a trading mistake. Also, maybe attacking the cube into Tar Creeper might have been a mistake too. Opening myself up to swipe that turn. But yeah, when I when I saw him play, it seemed like. I don't remember the exact instance. It's easier to remember when the games I actually played. But yeah, it did seem like there was a turn where I think he could have popped the cube, but I'm not 100% sure. The, there were a few other plays I saw that... I also saw he kept Hydronox in one of the games, too. I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, that was... I, I think I... Yeah, that, that seems odd to me, because you definitely want to pull that, that out with Master Oakart in that deck. If you yeah, can. or just, like, go for your curve, you know, like... I think Taunter Taunt still just wants to curve out, you know, he doesn't want to sit there and do nothing the whole game. Yeah, of, of all your opponents, I felt like he was in his head the most. He really? Just, mm -hmm. Yeah, just, I, I don't know, it, it was something about it, I, I just felt like mentally he he was just stressing. So. Yeah, yeah, if, yeah. You watch the, if, you watch, if you watch the VOD, he's you can tell he by game three he's completely tilted off his game. Really? Hmm. Yeah. Like so, and I guess that leads to the next question: Could you tell from your side, or are you just playing to what he was doing? Uh oh! I remember one play that I was like, uh, he naturalized my three-two Houndmaster when it was the only minion in play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that to me was like seemed a little bit unnecessary. But no, I mean besides that. I don't know. I, I couldn't really like tell that. Couldn't tell anything on the other side. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, All right. So um, now that we know that there are not going to be any nerfs incoming before the fall championships, um, is there anybody you are looking forward to having to face off against? And what are no. you what are you expecting from the meta? Um, without mm. giving away any of your uh, championship uh, strategy, of course. <laughs> I, I, I talk about my championship strategy on my stream all day long. And I literally say what decks I'm thinking about bringing. It doesn't bother me. Like, I, I, I know that I changed my mind a million times before submissions. So uh, whatever, whatever how I feel right now about the meta can easily change a week from now. So... You know, I don't. I'm pretty much an open book right now. I might be a little bit more closed off if it's like submissions were tomorrow, but it's far <laughs> enough out. Um, but yeah, I think that right now aggro decks are just the best. Um, I think that you know, I appreciate the kind words about my lineup, but I actually think it was the second best lineup. I think Saiyan's lineup was actually the best, and I think on top of that, I think the lineup I have right now that substitutes secret secret hunter for odd paladin. Might be even better than say in sign up, um, just because going forward, I think Secret Hunter's like kind of a weakish deck, and uh, Odd Paladin's a lot better against the aggro deck. So if you expect aggro to be the best, we'll just play the best counter to aggro while playing aggro yourself, and Odd Paladin does that. Um, yeah, I think so. Part of the reason for this is uh, so the meta game is kind of like a control anti control slash aggro meta game where control beats aggro because they play all these sweepers. Uh, aggro beats anti-control because they're too slow to get on the board, and then anti-control, of course, beats control. So, in theory, you should just have a rock, paper, scissors metagame. 33% should be represented across all three all three lineups, you know, given enough iterations. Uh, you know, obviously in Hearthstone, we only have a few iterations before the metagame completely changes due to sets coming out. So, I think right now, it's kind of interesting because a lot of control players did well to qualify. So we know these people might have an affinity for control, but they might also adapt and just play something completely different. But um, I think going into it, if you think about it, like control can never be anti-control because control decks are too slow. Like they can't beat Shutter. Like Odd Warrior can't beat Shutter Walk Shaman. You know, Odd Warrior can't beat decks like Quest Rogue. Like they just they, some decks just have inevitability, and you can't like beat that. So I think control decks already have an inherent weakness in the Rock Paper Scissors metagame. Because they can't beat the, they can't, you know, if they're a rock, they can't beat their paper some percentage of the time. Whereas control, or sorry, 
aggro can beat control sometimes because control doesn't draw all the resources it needs. And uh, anti-control can beat aggro because they can just draw the early game or aggro just doesn't get a fast enough start. So I think because of that, anti anti-control and aggro naturally are just a little bit better in the tournament meta. And if against the heads-off matchup, aggro just beats anti-control. So, you know, logically speaking, that just means aggro is just the best. Um, you know, and I don't think people necessarily realize that. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, but I don't think they do. So if, you know, my theory is correct, then aggro is just the best deck to play. And, like, the equilibrium should be, like, 50% aggro, um, like, 20% control, and, like, or maybe 25% control, 25% anti-control would be, like, the equilibrium for the meta. So every lineup has, um, you know, the same win rate, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, right now, I don't think that's necessarily what's happening. I don't think we're anywhere close to equilibrium. So you want to play the deck that's... You, you want to play the deck that just has the most win percentage points, and I think that's just aggro right now. And you talked uh, briefly there about the odd paladin, and... You know, that was mm -hmm. something that the casters brought up repeatedly during the event was that if you looked at who all brought Odd Paladin, you could see a trend because, like, every member of Tempo Storm, Odd Paladin was one of their decks, regardless of whatever yeah. the other three decks were. All members of that team brought Odd Paladin, and it, it you see it, it paid off in spades, for Saiyan. Well, Saiyan actually didn't play it. Oh, did he not? Yeah, I don't think... Actually, no Odd Paladins made top 8. Um, and I think the reason... I don't think the reason is because of Odd Paladin. I think the reason is because Saiyan brought Zoo, and the other Tempo Storm members didn't bring Zoo. Mm. Which, to me, is like... It's crazy, because Zoo's good against Druid, and everyone plays Druid. Zoo's good against Hunter. Everyone plays Hunter. Like, well, not everyone, but like a lot of decks play Hunter. So if they just subbed out their Secret Hunter, which I think was... Secret Hunter's just so hit or miss. You play four one-drops and you play two two-drops. It's like... It's feast or famine with that deck. Either you get your one-two curve, or you just draw a bunch of secrets against slow deck and you do nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the reason. But I, I think I think Odd Paladin still is strong, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, there is a little bit of inflation going on here. Uh, because Muzzy... Muzzy is more the brainchild of the lineup, I think. I know Muzzy has an affinity for Paladin. Every time he streams, he plays a terrible Paladin deck. I mean, he even admits it's terrible. I, he just tell he just loves playing Paladin. Um, but, yeah, I, I think he just loves Odd Paladin. And then I know Nostum, Yo, It's Flow. You know, some of these guys, that aren't, they're not necessarily, like, super competitive, but they manage to qualify and they're friends with Muzzy. I think what's happening is they're just playing the same lineup that Muzzy's playing and. Because you see that, the numbers get inflated. You know, Muzzy brings one deck, and then all of a sudden, five other people bring the same lineup. Oh, and, and Amnesia, too. I know Amnesia also likes Odd Paladin in tournaments, so... You know, if you got Amnesia and Muzzy telling you to play Odd Paladin for playoffs, you're probably going to listen to them. Yeah. Yeah, they're... they have a good reason not to. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we, we do have a question from our chat. Uh, Nibble TV asks... How much time and thought did you put into quitting your full-time job to pl to start streaming and playing Hearthstone? And do you think um, you've gotten better at the game because of it? Uh, yeah, I'm not going to lie. I put, you guys are going to laugh, I put zero thought into it. One day, I was just like, you know what, sounds great if I just quit my job to pursue gaming full-time. And as soon as I had that idea in my head, I just couldn't let go of it. Like, I just put my two weeks in. Pretty much the next day, I just—I don't know why—I just, I just felt so great about it. I just like felt so happy. I was like, I mean, things at my job weren't going spectacularly either. I was a software developer, and I was basically the messiest parts of our software. I was completely rewriting it, and I absolutely hated it, and it was making me miserable. Meanwhile, like I'm playing Hearthstone, it makes me so happy, and I have all this money saved up. So I'm just like, you know what? I'm just, I wanted to go look for another job anyways, basically. So I was just like, oh, let's just quit my job. Might as well take this time to stream Hearthstone. And then to answer the other question, uh, have I gotten better? I mean, absolutely. I feel like I feel like everybody has potential. You know, potential is like an empty cup. Maybe some people have more potential than others. But I think everybody can, you know, expand their cup to whatever size need be through enough work and enough practice. But, you know, I always felt like 
I, you know, just pl I played Magic for 13 years competitively. You know, I played on the Pro Tour several times. I used to play poker professionally before the U.S. shut it down. So I've always played games, and I feel like I've always had potential to do well, but I've always, like, focused on school or I've always focused on, you know, my job or whatever. So I never really gave it 100 per I, Never in my life have I ever been able to give 100% of my time, effort, and energy towards gaming. And, you know, now that I have a degree and now that I saved up money, I feel like I can take that risk, especially because if it doesn't work out, I can just go get another job. You know, I have a computer science degree from Georgia Tech, which I think... I, I keep getting job offers, like, emails... And not offers, but, you know, like, interview <laughs> offers. Like, I think the industry, I, I'm in a very fortunate place, basically. The industry is good enough that if this doesn't work out, I can go back to it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, oh, but going back to the potential analogy, yeah, I feel like, you know, it's just my potential bucket's just getting more and more full. Like, I think Carson's a very complex game, and you run into so many unique scenarios. Um, like, for example, I played a game against Saiyan where... Uh, he was playing Zoo, and he went turn one Flame Imp and a turn two Prince Kelseth, and my hand was double swipe, spreading plague, double arcane tire, and starfall. Ooh. And and so like I could have. It's it's kind of awkward, you know. You're put on the spot. It's Ouch. turn four. It's turn three even. I'm on coin. You can't. I, I had the option to coin out swipe and kill. I think two minions and put another one at one health, and then I could have swiped the next turn and cleared. Right. So I had the coin swipe and the swipe play, but I played enough ladder. Of this matchup to realize that no, you, you you don't do that. You just go for the full power spreading plague. And so turn three, I hero power pass. Turn four, I hero power pass. Turn five, I spreading plague for six. And then next turn, I'm able to starfall, deal two damage to everybody, play two arcane tyrants, and then after that, I can use the two swipes to start clearing the board. That that's usually the way you want to sequence it. And that's just like a perfect example of like a game where I don't know what I would have done in that moment if I hadn't seen that situation on ladder before, like. You know, it's a very tough call to make, and I could have easily seen myself going for the safe route, even though it's not as good. Well, that's... Uh, so, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, definitely feel like I've gotten better, but I feel like you just got to practice a lot in Hearthstone. You have four decks you have to bring. You know, that's 16 different matchups that you can play in a given, in a given you know, exchange. And to be knowledgeable in all 16 matchups, it just takes time and practice. There's, there's no substitute for that. You can theorize all you want, but if you get put into a situation that's unique, you've never seen before i mean it's just pretty much going to be experience that carries you through it that's that's awesome and uh you know as nibble says in chat props man that is just awesome Thank you. um takes guts yeah yeah, yeah. Something that I think the, th the other three of us here, like, you know, where we're at in our lives, it's like that's something we could never do. Yeah. And it's something that. Yeah, that's, that was another reason why I took the chance because, you know, I don't, I'm not married. I don't have kids, you know, so this is pretty much. It's uh, as you know, good I'm not a time as any, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, the time's yeah. not getting better as you get older. Right. Like, I yeah. realize that. So. so. All right. So, last, last question before we move on. Uh, so, how would you rank last weekend as far as birthday weekends go? I mean, 10 out of 10. 100 out of 10. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've had success in other games. So, when I play on the big stage for Magic, I don't get as excited. But for Hearthstone, it's special because I've never made that breakthrough. And for this to be, like, the first opportunity I've had to, like, get to the big stage is, I mean, it's just incredible. That's awesome. Weird. I've had a lot of near misses. You know, I've played other playoffs, and I've been one round off. Yeah. I've been one round off one time, and I was two rounds off another time. So to finally just, like, break through this time feels really good. Yeah. we Like uh, Versika said earlier, we were all cheering for you, and we were super proud to see you uh, moving on to that big stage. So uh, we've, we've all followed you since that first time we met you back in 2016 when you came to Knoxville for uh, yeah, HCC. Yeah, I miss that. So. I wish they still had the venue there. I mean <laughs> – we it was, it was nice seeing you guys, and it was nice driving three hours or whatever. <laughs> you know, you get... <laughs> Instead of having to fly to like Texas, yeah. <laughs> was, yeah, exactly. All right. Well, I that... mean, Texas venue was nice too, but you know, that's that's good. So. <laughs> let's uh let's talk about this big announcement that uh Blizzard made yesterday. They called it what? in the works. An yeah, so they called it in the works. And they started off with the state of the meta saying, eh, you see these fires behind us? 
It's all fine. It's all good. <laughs> so, uh, Bloody, what are your thoughts on the state of the meta right now as far as a whole? Oh, man. I mean, uh, I mean, as a whole, I think it's fine, personally. But there's just so many different perspectives to look at it from. You know, you can look at it from the percentages perspectives where how often is, are each class represented how many different archetypes are being played within each class what are their win rates and i think if you look at that it's it's pretty it's pretty evenly spread i mean druid warlock rogue obviously have a fair, more than their fair share but they have enough uh class diversity and enough classes are represented that i think it's fine in that aspect uh, i think part of the reason people feel bad about this meta is because there are a lot of matchups that as soon as you queue them on ladder, you just feel like the game's already over before it started. Like, you queue against Zoo and they just have Tron Flame up and a turn two Prince Kalaseth. It's like, oh, well, great, Zoo got the Nest Star. If you queue against Death Rogue, oh, you got the egg into Terra Scale. If you're, if you're Warrior and you queue against Quest Rogue, you just, some people just concede, don't even bother playing out that matchup. And so I think the fact that there's a lot of like polarization either in the matchup or the early turns just makes people feel bad and feel like they don't necessarily have control over their games. Um, but from a percentage perspective, everything's fine. You know, it's like close to 50-50. You have your nut draw 50% of the time, I have my nut draw 50% of the time, but people don't want to like necessarily just play, you know, for their nut draws in the early game or whatever, play for their ideal matchup. They want to just play a game of Hearthstone where they feel like it's close and both players get to make cool decisions and make, you know, feel like their decisions have an impact. And I feel like, you know, in this meta, there are some matchups where you get that feeling, but the way ladder is right now, it's just not like that because the aggro decks are too good. And that, because the aggro decks are so good, um, it just makes it so the gameplay is a lot faster and it matters a lot more what you do in your early turns. But it, I think if they had more tournaments, you know, like for example, I played against like Q-Block and I played against Taunt Warrior this weekend. And when you play Maligos versus Taunt Warrior, that's not like a matchup that's just instantly over. You know, you get to both players make a lot of interesting decisions. and. That's not a matchup you see on ladder a lot because Q blocks weak against aggro or Mali lock or Mali ghost isn't as good as token druid or whatever on ladder. So we just don't see these matchups a lot on uh, ladder. And I think that's where most people's experience come from. So I think that's why people feel bad or feel like the meta is stale or whatever. But there's also the concern that the meta hasn't changed that much since Boomsday Project. Even odd decks are still on top. Death Knights still have a huge impact. Mechs were kind of a joke. I mean, like, there's no mech deck. I mean, that's to me, that's pretty disappointing. I thought Mech Warrior was going to be a thing. I didn't. Obviously, Odd Warrior makes sense, more sense now, but it, you know, it kind of sucks that the whole theme that they were pushing for Boomsday just kind of fell apart. I, I kind of felt like. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Well, talking about mechs, um, you know, a lot of people are complaining about Giggling Inventor being OP. And. You know, we per personally, we have talked on the show about, you know, how there are answers for giggling. Uh, from your perspective, buddy, what are your thoughts? Do you feel like giggling inventor needs a nerf? Um, I don't think it needs a nerf. <laughs> I think there needs to be more cards like giggling inventor, to be honest. Um, how do I phrase this? It's... It, it's hard to phrase. Like, I think Giggling Inventor and Token Druid specifically is, like, very powerful, and it's kind of obnoxious there. But having a neutral way to, like, slow down the game, I think, is very important. You know, it cr helps create longer games. And like you said, there are answers like Mossy Horror and Blood Knight. But, it, I mean, it does kind of feel bad that, like, a lot of the game can revolve around, I played my Giggling, does my opponent have the Blood Knight or not? Or my opponent plays Giggling, do I have the Mossy or Blood Knight or not? And, you know... Again, that kind of goes back to the polarization. You're playing two completely different games, one where you have an answer, one where you don't have an answer, and they feel completely different. One where the other, one, one, you feel great, you know, you have giggling and it survives, and the other, oh, my opponent lost me, now you feel terrible. So I think giggling, because there are, like, answers to it, it can, again, it just helps create these games that aren't very fun. But I think giggling by itself is, I don't think it needs to be nerfed. I, like... I actually think if there were more cards like it, maybe Giggling wouldn't be such a big deal. You know, if there were more cards that generated more stuff to go wide and more, like, taunts and more stuff to slow down game, Giggling would just be another on-curve card, and it wouldn't mm. be that big of a deal. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, but, I knew I liked you for a reason. <laughs> yeah, just the fact that there's no other real five drops that go on that slot yeah. in the game. Yeah, like, literally, like, like the only other five drop that I know sees play regularly is Wargear. Or not Wargear, uh, Zilliax. Yep. Yeah. And that's a completely different feel of a card. It's just like a single target, heal for three, yeah. maybe heal for six. But, yeah, yeah, it's... Yeah, so, like, yeah, the fact that there's, like, no competition for that spot and also, you know, makes, yeah, giggling, like, okay, we need a five drop here, and this one's good, it's defensive. Yeah, exactly. If there was more options in the five drop slot, like, it's like aggro decks play Fungal Mancer, slow decks play Giggling, it's like, mm. uh, I mean. Yeah. And I don't think Giggling will be that big of a problem once the set rotates. Yeah, yeah once we lose, once that's... we lose, uh, Quest. The, yeah, the mammoth, the mammoth, the mammoth, the mammoth years. Yeah, cards. rogue abusing giggling. I think that's the problem, right? Or decks are abusing giggling, but those decks themselves were already OP. It's not. Yeah, yeah. Giggling, giggling might have pushed it over the top in terms of win percentage points, but yeah. it's those decks should have just like Sonya should just cost like five mana or something. Mm. I don't think Quest is really. Fine. I think Sonya is the problem. I, yeah, I, I personally, agree. Sonya is, is Sonya is OP. I'll give you that one. Um, I'll be happy to take the 3200 dust back. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> Blizzard Blizzard has announced they are not making any changes to that card, but they they are putting it on their to watch list. It's one of the cards they they are going to have eyes on. Um, so Matt, why don't you tell us um, next up? They talked about wild balance and requesting feedback from the community. I know you've been playing quite a bit of wild as you are competing in the wild uh, into the wild. Uh, podcast league why don't you tell us a little bit about this yeah so they go on the post basically talking about a discussion they're having internally of what wild should feel like whether it should be basically standard plus or completely broken uh personally it just like for me i'm glad they're asking the community what we want but the fact that they have no idea what they're going to do and they have no kind of direction of how they want to take the format is kind of kind of disheartening. And the fact that, and like, honestly, what wild players want is just support. We want, like, an, we want a wild tournament more than once a year. We want actually, like, you know, maybe like a HCG, you know, Hearthstone Championship Tour for wild as well. Have that. Played at BlizzCon, do something other than just that one time a year at the beginning of a set, rotate, right as the sets rotate out. Uh, so, like, and part of me is thinking, like, just balance wise, yeah, like, Starliner Druid is the deck to um, that you are kind of facing and is, is the, the Boogeyman deck of Wild right now. But should we, and I guess, should there be a should we just make wild wild again where any of the nerfs that happen to cards like say even undertaker like gadgets at five mana gadgets and auctioneer four mana leroy kazakas giving making your hero power zero again one or not kazakas uh, raza yeah raza the chain make it zero again let's let's just either reprint or make like wild like a wild format again where okay over like so you can so you can play patron warrior again like the old school patron warrior deck or patron warrior deck with new cards and see how that does so it just it's just kind of upsetting to see like yeah it's like we we they basically like we don't know what to do what do you guys want to do and it's like they have no direction and that just upsets me well i feel like magic went through that as well when they when they made the or when when type two magic came became so popular, and that's kind of like there was a time when that was all people were interested in playing, and like your your uh, type one magic was was people were just like, hey, we still are here, we still have these massive collections of powerful cards that we want to use, and mm -hmm. you know, look over here, help us, help us, and it took magic a while to figure out what they wanted to do. Yeah. With the modern, people. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and even then, I don't know that their answer was was great, but they did take their time to try to figure out a way to best serve those players. Um, and I think, 
you know, one of the benefits of having such an influx of new people into Team Five is that you know maybe you're going to get some new ideas here, maybe not. Maybe maybe idea generation isn't their thing, and so they know that they realize that right away, and they they come out to the community and say, "Look, we're at our wits' end. We don't want to give you something that you don't want." Uh, we're just not going to throw something out there. So what do you guys want? So, you know, you can really look at it two ways. You can look at it as, yeah, they don't really have any direction, but at least their egos aren't preventing them from coming to the community and saying, what do you really want? Yeah. Uh, do you play any Wild Bloody or? Um, the last time I played Wild was when the Heroic Tavern Brawl was out and I played the giant deck, the... Not Nagasi Witch deck and yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you were mean, that I, guy. <laughs> so, so you're everybody else in Wild at that at that time, basically. Because yeah. I just wanted to win some packs, man. <laughs> yeah. Hey, the one thing I do have to say for Nagasi Witch in its defense, and yeah, I hated that deck when before they nerfed it, is the fact that like yeah, just about every class could have done it. At least yeah. like at least it's not just Druid that's the boogeyman. It's everybody that's the boogeyman. Yeah. That. So um, another big announcement that they made in this post is that they are adding cards to the classic set to replace Hall of Fame cards. So you guys know every year they select a few cards that really have kind of helped to define the meta and they move them into the Hall of Fame where they're considered still playable in Wild, but they're no longer playable uh, in standard, and they are adding cards to kind of fill that space. Um, the first card is Icicle. It's a two mana epic mage spell that deals two damage to a minion if it's frozen. Draw a card. So this is kind of, I feel like this is kind of the replacement for, um, and now I'm not going to remember the names of any of these cards. It was Iceland. Yeah, Iceland. Yeah, yeah. It was, I was gonna say it was the freeze mage staple. But yeah, <laughs> which one? Yeah, exactly. So um, then you're gonna have Tomb of Intellect, one mana common mage spell. Add a random mage spell to your hand. Call of the Void, one mana common warlock spell. Add a random demon to your hand. And Pilfer, one mana common rogue spell. Add a card to your hand from your opponent's class. Now, I know players have been asking for cards to be moved into Classic. Cards that have rotated out, like Reno or something, to be moved into and considered Classic. But this is kind of a different way to take this. Um, do you see any of these cards just out of, you know looking forward bloody that you think any of these might make it into tournament style decks um i don't think so i think they're all pretty bad okay. you don't really want to add random like it, it's just like if you could choose between a random demon or choosing a card to put in your deck like i don't think you would choose the random demon right yeah, like you, you, just, you want to try to mitigate you know what your deck RNG, needs. right yeah well I mean, if the RNG is good, if it was like add a random demon and half the time gain five life or something, you know, I think that'd be excellent. <laughs> I'll take the I'll take the free RNG on that. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's just it's just not a powerful enough effect to warrant. Like maybe if it was zero mana, maybe like I don't even know if it's zero mana would be playable. Like you have to spend you literally have to spend a mana to get the card. Like yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not I'm not a fan of any of these. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we weren't really either when we first looked at them. It was like, eh, let's let's get somebody else's opinion who you know uh, would actually probably be looking at these and and classifying these a little different than we would. Um, the next big thing they announced, and this is, I feel like this is this is big from an innkeeper's perspective. And I know our friend Espo over on Legend of the Innkeeper is is just giddy about this. But they are improving the new player experience by adding additional ranks 50 to 26 
with free gifts after each of the ranks as you climb up to rank 25. So this is kind of a catch-up mechanic for people who are just getting into Hearthstone. They'll start at rank 50, and they'll only be queued against people who are rank 50 to rank 26 as they level. So after each level, they'll be earning packs, and they'll be earning card backs, and they'll be earning... Uh, things like that. To, so by the time they reach rank 25, hopefully they are a little more prepared than players who are coming in right now at rank 25 and, you know, facing off against somebody who hasn't played in three months but is playing Quest Rogue or something like that and just absolutely demolishing them. So I, I really think this is going to help spark players interest and keep them excited about the game at least until they hit rank 25 and run up against odd paladin you know <laughs> <laughs> so all right and uh the other big thing they talked about was tournament mode being on hold um so bloody what are your thoughts about them putting shelving an in-game tournament mode it's very frustrating um I mean, I, I I get it's a business, and I get this is how businesses work. It's more important you need the new players because that's what keeps the game keeps the game churning. But it's also just it feels ridiculous that Hearthstone's been around for what like is it five years, maybe six years now, and there's still no tournament mode. Even though a lot of games, one of the first things they implement is a tournament mode, and it's just like, can we at least get just anything. I, I, it doesn't have to be... Like, I feel like every single feature they add, they're just like, well, how is a new player going to benefit from this? And they're like, we don't know what to do with tournament mode with new players, so we're just going to ignore it. But, like, I mean, the retention is also important. Like, I don't know what percentage of people care about tournament mode or what percentage of people want to play competitively, but I, I do know that it, it's a non-zero amount. It might be small enough that they just don't care, but I know a lot of people that, like, they play Magic Arena and they play and they play Hearthstone, but they get bored of Hearthstone because they're just tired of the ladder grind and you know they don't have tournaments to play and they want that like competitive aspect without like having to commit enough time to become a pro. And tournaments would be a, kind of a nice in between, even if it's just like a weekly tournament that you could play in, or if you could just grind gold, or if you could just get like golden cards, or you know just like anything, you know just another form of playing constructed. I mean, and, and the other thing is this, like, so interesting to me about Hearthstone are the tournaments. You know, bringing four decks in a lineup is completely different than playing on ladder. It's just a completely different metagame. And if we had tournament mode, I think more and more people could appreciate that and have fun with that side of Hearthstone. But unfortunately, it's like, what new player is going to have one deck ready, let alone four decks? You know, I just think every little feature they make has to be looked through the lens of a new player. So I understand that it's not the highest priority, but... I mean, as a competitive player, I I wish they cared about us more. Um, they've done a, they've done a few things. I mean, putting this on hold, and there's a few other things. I don't have to go into detail. That kind of shown that like they don't really care about competitive players that much. I mean, they, they'll have them around, and they might care about the top 0.01 percent. You know, the Clintos and the Ties and Soleils and Firebats and those kind of players. But for the average grinder and the average competitive player, there's just very little support. And, you know, it, it makes sense why there's a small proportion of the players and we don't really give them the money. So, you know, I mean, I get it. But at the same time, I'll just sit here patiately waiting. I still love Hearthstone. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to leave because there's some tournament mode. But I, I would love it if they would do something, anything, just anything towards tournament mode. It would make me very happy. Okay. Uh, Versica, your thoughts on shelving tournament mode? You can actually find those at HeroPowerHS.com. I did. Uh, I, I wrote on it yesterday. And while in a lot of ways, I, I like I recognize that this is a big deal for a and, and, and I would put that percentage at somewhere. I, I mean, I, I'm going to put it higher than a lot of people. I would say 15 to 20 percent of our staff right now would be super thrilled to have a, a competitive tournament mode. But I think right now with with the influx of new people into Team 5 and wrapping their heads around the direction that Team 5 is going to move now, 
um, they've got their eyes set on the expansion coming up after the one that's going to launch in December. Um, they've got a meta that people aren't really enjoying, but it's balanced for the most part. I mean, it's 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 fairly like like uh, Bloody Face said, it's a rock paper scissors meta. So you've got good representation, better than having one or two set, one or two decks that just sit at the top. Uh, but I, I think they have yet to kind of find that balance. And the amount of time and effort that it's going to take to implement that mode and manage it, not even if the mode is good, but just the time and effort it's going to take to manage it for the smaller portion of their player base, not just really concentrating, not just saying, well, new players aren't going to play this. New players aren't going to play it anyway. They're not going to get in and play tournament mode. But your players that have been here for six months that have a little bit of a collection, they are going to be interested in sticking their nose in. And if they stick their nose in and they just get it beaten off or they have they get in it and the matchmaking puts your son up against Bloody Face or, you know, Riv up against Bloody Face in that first match, it's, it's going to create issues that I don't know that they know how to fix right now. So as... as and, and I'm not a competitive player, so I'm speaking simply from a, a person who loves the game and wants to see it grow. I want, um, you know, I, I want the mode to come in, and I want it to be good. I want it to fulfill the need that has been promised to all of Hearthstone, not just the competitive players. But I, I want it to come in, and I don't want it to be the problem child that they push off in the corner and then just leave because it only works for a couple of people, not a, a, a couple of groups of people, and then not support it. Like, I feel like they've done with Wild right now. It's like, okay, this is how you want to play. We're going to give you this mode, and then we're just going to push you off in the corner, and we're not really going to do anything with it. So it just sits there, and it doesn't grow, and it's not, it's not given the attention that, really, I feel like, for this mode to be successful and to... to really bring Hearthstone where it needs to be uh, in line with the other collectible card games because they are catching up. Uh, in some ways, they're they're passing Hearthstone by, so that it's a problem that they've got to get figured out, but I would rather them figure it out than to just put something out and then just shove it off to the side. Yeah, and, and if you guys want to uh, get more in-depth, as he mentioned, please go to HeroPowerHS.com. It's the first post on the first page uh, give it a read and uh, leave a comment or shoot us an email at heropowerpodcast at gmail.com with your thoughts because we would like to hear uh, more on that. Um, they also announced the new uh, private fireside gatherings. So as an innkeeper for us, what this means is you can now schedule a fireside gathering and it not be posted on the uh, firesidegatherings.com and you can host those in your home for your friends and it not be open to the public so that's that's a good uh quality of life improvement um they are bringing so, Go I, I, have, I have a question for you on this is this because of the spoofing for nimsy um, I feel like this is in response to the copious amounts of reports they were getting from people hosting events in their home. And then putting in the comments, private event, don't show up, I will shoot. <laughs> so I think this is kind of an answer to that because there were hundreds and hundreds of uh, firesides being reported every month for because one of the things was... You're not supposed to hold it, and it's supposed to be open to the public. Yeah, I like this just because you know it allows more people, like you know, you and your buddies can get together, you know, in your in you know in your house, have a you know a few brews and play the actual and actually somebody other than you know, going to a tavern and playing the fireside brawls that are actually really phenomenal brawls, you know, so that you can actually you know so that more people have access to that. I think it's a really cool. I think it's like you know it's a great feature. Yeah, it's in response to some issues I had, but I think it's actually a great feature. Yeah. Um, real quickly, just to touch on the last couple of things, uh, they are bringing back the welcome bundle. 
Uh, only instead of a random class legendary now, you will be receiving a random classic dragon legendary. Um, the All Hollows End event is back starting October 17th. There will be dual class arenas again, which uh, was a blast last year. So much fun. I love that. Yeah. I really love that. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. And the Headless Horseman Brawl is coming this year. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, new Paladin Hero, Sir Anoyo. Oh. That's all I can Hello. say. Hello. Oh. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so, all right. Um, this week's Tavern Brawl is Duel of the Death Knights. Um, the DKs have all come out to celebrate Days of the Frozen Throne. Choose a class. You will be given a random deck and start the game as a Death Knight. Um, decks do appear to be completely random. So go get your pack, have some fun, and check it out. All right. And actually... You'll have to play. You'll have to play for at least win at least five of these to get the the second three hundred gold quest done. By the way, just yes. a heads up. Yes. So, all right, that brings us to this week's deck analysis. And since we had uh, the uh, luxury of having Bloody Face join us this week, and as Versika pointed out, he is such an adept rogue player. He is going to show us. The uh, proper way, <laughs> I guess you could say, to play <laughs> the quest rogue. So um, I will run down his deck list this week, and then I'll turn it over to him to kind of talk about how the deck plays, what you're looking for in your opening hand, and then we'll play a couple of games with it. So uh, the deck list consists of two preparation, two shadow step, two glacial shard, two South Sea deck hand, one Stone Tusk Boar, uh, then of course the quest, the caverns below, then it has two Wax Elemental, two Novice Engineer, two Vicious Scalehide, two Youthful Brewmaster, two Fan of Knives, one Mimic Pod, Sonya Shadow Dancer, Zola the Gorgon, two Elven Minstrels, two Giggling Inventors, two Vanish, and Valera the Hollow. So uh, take it away, sir. Tell us a little bit about how to play this deck. Um, well, it's not exactly a deck that I could cover in a few minutes, but the essential... Because it is a very complex deck to play optimally, but the premise of the deck is you have this card called Caverns of Blow or something. It's a, it's a quest. It's a one-minute quest that basically whenever you play the same minion five times at any point in the game, your quest transforms into a five-minute spell that makes all your minions 4-4s four permanently. And because this deck runs a bunch of cheap spells, or sorry, a bunch of cheap minions that have a bunch of utility on them, like you run Wax Elemental, which is Divine Shield Taunt. Giggling Venner makes two Divine Shield Taunts. You have Vicious Scale Hide, that's a 4-4 four four Rush Lifesteal. You have all these cheap minions with all these different utilities that, when they're 4-4s, four you're getting a really good deal on your mana. You're, you're spending one mana for a 4-4 four, four Divine Shield Taunt, you're spending five mana for a 4-4 four, four, and two other 4-4 four, four Divine Shield Taunts. And uh, This deck is very strong against slower decks because you have the time to set up, you know, you have time to replay the same minions over and over, and then finally finish them off by just having an army of minions that you can re refill every turn. But against uh, aggressive decks is where you generally struggle because they're trying to kill you before you complete your quest. And you're trying to stop them from killing you and you're trying to complete your quest at the same time. And trying to do both of those things don't exactly line up very well. Um, so that's one reason that you can struggle against them. Okay. Yeah, that's basically the premise of the deck. Okay. And uh, what, do you, what is an optimal uh, opening hand? Um, so it depends on... This deck is... Pretty matchup dependent, but you always want Sonya in your opening hand. That's cards a windmill slam. Uh, you always, you usually want Vanish against aggressive decks because one way that you can get a leg up on them is, you know, after they filled up your board and you haven't really gotten on the board, you can prep Vanish or you can just cast Vanish, and you can just wipe all their minions away and just kind of get a turn to like reset and get back on the board. Um, so I'd say Sonya and Vanish are typically the cards that you keep the most. Against slower decks, you can keep cards like Youthful Brewmaster, Shadow Step to like, you know, get your combo going. But against aggressive decks, it really depends. It, it depends if you're on coin. Depends if you're on the play. You, you gotta, you gotta really fight for the board. And I mean, like, really fight. Like, sometimes you don't play Quest Turn One because you just really need to fight for the board. Um. So yeah. 
Okay. All right. Cool. So, um, yeah. So we're going to go check this deck out. We're going to watch, uh, we're going to watch bloody face, uh, play this and, uh, we're going to play a couple of games with it just to kind of give you guys an idea of how it works. And we hope you'll stick around and check it out. So if you are joining us on Twitch or YouTube, Please stay tuned for the live play portion of the show. If you are listening via the audio podcast, we'd like to thank you for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at HeroPower underscore cast. You can find all of our past episodes on YouTube at youtube.com slash ECMMOGamers or on our website at HeroPowerHS.com. Uh, Bloody, why don't you tell the folks where they can find you? Sure. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is BloodyFaceHS, all one word. Uh, same thing on Twitch. You can follow. I stream almost every day, five times a week usually. Same handle, Bloody Face HS. Okay, awesome. Uh, if you enjoy our show and you would like to help support and improve it, you can do so by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash hero power. And we'll see you all again next week. Don't forget to use your hero power. That sounds weird ah. saying it for me. <laughs> At least he got said. He's very good to be proud. All right. So, uh, Bloody, as soon as you are ready, if you want to uh, find a worthy opponent, we will spectate. Sounds good. All right. Coming up now. It looks like you got a pack there to open. Yeah, yeah, I will open that after the games before we. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll send you an invite. Much appreciated, sir. Okay. All right, so it looks like we're playing against Druid. Now, we don't know, there's so many different kinds of Druid. So typically, I'll err more on the side of it being token, since you want to make sure you can beat the token decks. Uh, so typically, you're just looking for Fan and Eyes, Vanish, or Sonya. Uh, if we know it's Mally or Mill, I would keep Elven Minstrel, but because it might not be either one of those, I'm just going to mulligan it. Ooh, Zol's going to All right, so it looks like we're not going to have much to do in the early game so far. That's kind of what it looks like when you play Quest Rogue. Your opening hand usually looks pretty bad. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Zola so giggling just... prep and just drew into Elvish Minstrel. And I didn't hit with Dagger, even though I don't have a play next turn, because it's just getting one damage on your opponent is very is worth very low, considering how important the Dagger could be if he's actually token. Uh, here, I'm just going to re-dagger. just going to save the Zolan Brewmaster. Uh, I think I might have to prep out the Elven next turn. I mean, I would love to draw Mimic Pod or even Fan and Ives. You just can't really afford to pass too much. All right, so he played Twig, so we know he's playing... Uh, he's playing uh, probably Mally, but also maybe Mill. And here, we're just going to prep out the Elven... All right, looks like we got a South Sea that we can maybe go on. He also has his Twig, so we really want to find Glacial Shard before he can uh, burn us out. Also, had Wild Growth this game. If he has Nourish 2, we might be in trouble. Yeah, he has Nourish 2. This is a... Uh, and a Wild Growth. Um, and Arcane Tyrant. All right. It's uh, not looking too good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, his draw is looking really good. It's a, it's a very good draw, yeah. Um, we did draw a second giggling, but usually want to save that for after quest complete. Uh, I think in this case we can just go. Hmm. Would you consider running the quest on giggling? Uh, I don't think you generally want to do that just because of spreading plague. Oh, you're right. You're right. Um, so yeah, here we just want to be as man efficient as possible. So we're going to probably go in on the South Sea. Uh, let's see. So if we go to LC, Youth Fullest 3, can't really do anything after that. Uh, you know what? That was actually a misplay. I eh, know that's actually fine. So what we can do is I think we just go in on Youthful Brewmaster. 
since one thing that you can do is if you have two brewmasters and a shadow stuff, you can just go brewmaster, brewmaster, uh, shadow stuff the brewmaster, and then we can just go play three, bre three brewmasters next turn and already be quest complete. Just go ahead and kill wow. the... Yeah, that's awesome. All right. Yeah, I almost forgot you could do that. It's just one thing you pick up on. Yeah, this is really bad, though. He's already casting Ultimate Infestation on turn I'm five. Turned. That's ridiculous. Yeah, so generally, even though we have quest complete, we don't have... Uh, we need uh, the Frost Elemental, Glacial Shard, or whatever. So we'll go ahead and complete quest. We had prep, though. Unfortunately, we used our prep earlier in the game. If we had prep, we could actually prep out the quest completion here. So I think I'm just going to play the Wax Elemental to try and save a little bit of damage. And we can just hold the South Sea in order to play it. But yeah, he's going to be able to pop Twig next turn, so if we don't draw Glacial Shard next turn, uh, we might just be dead. Like, actual lethal. Because we're, we're at 18. So, I mean, if he has Mali... Oh, Actually, is, Ironwood. Uh, oh, okay. Ironwood. Iron. So uh, that almost certainly means he's not Mally then, because Mally's almost always run Floop. Yeah. Uh, if you're running Ironwood, you're almost definitely not running Floop. But with that being said, we might not be dead next turn. We're still under a lot of pressure. Uh, so we might just play Giggling here. We should draw Glacial Shard, though. Oh, but I'm, I'm not a top deck. Yeah, but I'm actually not really worried about the twig now that he played Ironwood Golem, since I don't think he's playing Mally. So I think we'll let him pop the twig if he wants to next turn. I'm more worried about just dying. It's eight damage. Uh, I might play Giggling. He's already played the swipe. I might just have to take a risk here and play Giggling. We could, and... we could freeze the board with the Glacial Shard. With uh... Yeah. Zola. Oh, we only get two freezes, though. No, you get three. Um, you get the Brewmaster as well. Well, that's uh, one, three, four, seven, eight mana total. Oh, you're right. Because you have to replay the shard twice. Uh, but even replaying the shard twice might not be too bad. Actually, I think I kind of like that. Still might die here, though. Never know what people are playing. Uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and Brewmaster the Zola, though, since I value the Zola a little bit higher. So, all right, he gets a Twig turn if he wants it, but it honestly might not be that great, because he might need to save it for Azelina Togwaggle. We're also in a kind of awkward spot. He could, he could Azelina us right now, since he knows we have Quest in hand. Like he could actually copy our hand. And that might be bad for us. That's a good thing we have freeze face, because I'm not sure if everybody knows this interaction, but if you freeze face and they play a death knight, they actually uh, get unfrozen. All right, so he's just doing this. That's not too bad. It's definitely Togwaggle, then. Yeah, it's definitely Togwaggle. Um, yeah, this is still looking pretty rough. We can... Play Crystal Core, Vicious Scale Hide, and South Sea. Trade, 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 trade. That's still not enough to kill everything. Yeah, we really needed to draw like a prep there or something. But we could go up to 12 and leave 12 on board. Yeah. So playing Crystal Core is just not an option right now. So we have to play Giggling, I think. Is that right? See five attacks. He soak up two. Five, ten, thirteen. He look for four, twelve. Yeah. So we're dead if we play Crystal Core. It's really unfortunate. So yeah, we have to play Giggling here. And I think we just lose if he plays Swipe. I'm gonna go ahead and Zola the. Hmm. I saw Zola the Giggling. <sighs> Yeah, I, we're just dead to swipe no matter what. I'll kill the 1-5. So the Anoyotrons can absorb 4 bits. I mean, we're dead to naturalize, too. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, this just looks almost impossible to win. Yeah, even though he's playing mill, still able to. Oh, well, he had that turn five yeah, not... UI. That that, that kind of helps his game plan a lot. Yeah, yeah. The uh, turn two wild growth and the turn three twig to turn four nourish wild growth arcane tyrant and the coin UI. I think the only thing that makes that a little bit better is if you had the second tyrant. Yeah, that was that was. Uh, besides sick. the second tyrant, I think that's a perfect draw. <laughs> yeah. So, oh well, it's usually a good matchup, but they, if they pressure you, that yeah, that matchup could have actually gone really long because uh, they run double spreading plague and some of them run double giggling, so they can just and then if they Azalina you and they take your giggling as well, or if they run my control text too. Yeah. Oh well. So that was one game. You want to get one more in? See if we can redeem. Uh, I think, I think I actually have to go. Okay. Unfortunately. Okay. But sorry. No, that's fun. That's fun. So uh, yeah, that was awesome. It was it was good to, uh, great to have you on the show again. Um, gosh, I guess the Thank last you. time we had you on was episode thirty three, and this was episode one hundred and forty nine. So uh, we definitely need to try to get you on a little more often. <laughs> Definitely. Happy to be here. So, all right. Well, with all of that, again, uh, thank you for being here. And uh, if anybody out there has any questions or comments about the show, please email us at heropowerpodcast at gmail.com. Do us a favor and hit that subscribe button below on YouTube if you've not done so. Give us a follow on Twitch to be alerted when we go live. And make sure you go and give uh, Bloody Face a follow on Twitch as well and on Twitter. And uh, for more details about our Patreon, check out patreon.com slash hero power. Until next week, good gaming. Bye. See you guys.